Hello, and welcome to our podcast on another literary term that we're going to be looking at throughout the year. This one is called bias, a relatively important term throughout our look at nonfiction pieces this year. It's also going to be coming up a lot as we continue to study government and economics as our companion course. So let's go ahead and see what we mean by this. So what is bias? Bias is the point of view from which a text is presented. And we will probably be using words like perspective, point of view, bias, or slant synonymously, interchangeably, meaning they all kind of mean the same thing. And so when we say it's the point of view of an article, or we say it's the bias of the article, we're just trying to ask you to look at who's writing it, where is it coming from, what do they support, what do they question, what are they critical of, things like that. So you'll hear us use these words almost interchangeably throughout class. But in short, bias is the point of view of an article, or of a person, or of a text. Why does this matter? Why do we need to study this? Well, the big reason is that every text has a bias. Every movie, every poem, every song, novel, everything has a bias. And so the first thing we want to do is determine what is the bias? Whose perspective is this sharing? Whose perspective is being pushed forward by this text? Once we do that, then we're probably a little bit better off in terms of determining its message or theme. And so the bottom part is there, we have to look at this and go, okay, where are they coming from? What's their point of view? What's their bias? Should we believe their point of view? Is it reliable? Is it credible? This will help us figure out whether we're going to accept the message in this text or reject it because of its bias, whether it's too much, too little, something we agree with, something we question, items like that. So one thing you'll hear us say again throughout the year is that every text does have a bias. Pretty much everything is created by a human being, and humans have their own biases. We can't be completely neutral. And so when we are completing a text, we put in our own bias. Oftentimes it's exceptionally intentional in terms of maybe a sports writer writing about his own sports team. He's going to make his hometown team seem great. He's going to cut down or be critical of the opponents. But that bias might also be a little less obvious, more subtle. Some of the word choices they use, some of the coverage of items might be a little bit skewed. And so our job is to figure out what is the bias of this text, who are they supporting, who are they being critical of, and then eventually, can I learn from this? Those are kind of the steps we want to be taking. So here's a visual example of some texts with different bias. On the left, we have a book written about George W. Bush. On the right, another one written about the same president. And I think if you start to get a little bit more specific in terms of your attention to detail, you might be able to see some of the biases that are revealed from these two different authors. At this point, take a moment, stop the podcast, and see if you can look at some of the details and point out how each one gives a different perspective on this guy's presidency. So welcome back. Some of the things you might have noticed on the left-hand side this is clearly going to be a book that is critical of George W. Bush. It's going to point out the negatives of his presidency. And here are some of the ways they're doing it. One, the image itself is kind of dark. Down in the bottom right, we have his picture with kind of this sarcastic smirk. He doesn't look all that honest. So clearly the author is going to be questioning what he did. The name of the book is Shrub, a small bush. He doesn't even get his full name up there. Also, we have the short but happy political life of George W. Bush, implying that he had a short life as a politician, that he did not have long-reaching effects of his presidency, that he is sure he was there for eight years, but that everything was relatively ineffective. Now contrast this whole text on the left with that on the right. You can see the visual image itself of the cover, very light colors, oftentimes signifying positive. There's a very famous image of him on there where he is speaking through a bullhorn. And if you have the background knowledge for this, you may know or may remember that this is where he spoke at the 9-11 Ground Zero site 
a few days after the 9-11 attacks. Probably one of the greatest moments of his presidency. He was never a great public speaker when he was just making it up as he went, but this moment where he spoke at the 9-11 Ground Zero site, just completely off the cuff, off the script, pulled up a bullhorn, started talking to the firefighters and the rescue workers, very inspirational, a great moment. So from this, we can tell that the author is going to paint George W. Bush in a very positive light. You can also see from the title, The Right Man. Not hey, right guy, right time, wrong time, wrong person, anything like that. It's just saying, hey, he was the right man. It was a surprise presidency, but he did a great job. And that bias of that author, by, of David Frum, is reinforced by the light colors, the positive imagery. And you can start to see, here's one text, The Life of George W. Bush presented in two different points of view, and therefore they both have their own individual bias. So as we continue our study through high school and hopefully into college for all of you guys, we have to realize that bias or point of view is not inherently bad. We can't simply go up to a text and say, ah, that's biased. I have nothing to learn from it. It's completely biased. We as strong readers and consumers of information need to do a couple things to continue to push ourselves mentally to identify that bias and then potentially learn from it. So here's what good readers and consumers of information do. We look at a text and start to predict what is that text bias. We know that certain authors or certain creators support different things. And so if we know that we are watching a film by Michael Moore, we know his bias. He's going to be on the liberal end of the spectrum. He's going to be critical of the conservative side of the political spectrum. From there, we know what he's going to put forth. And so number two, we have to look for the facts in a text. When we're reading about the Broncos playing the Raiders, where are their facts? And then we have to separate those from where are the opinions of the author. Because we can still learn from a biased source. We just have to be a little bit more savvy in picking out the facts, those things that are proven true, from the opinions those things that the author is infusing from his or her own mind in terms of a perspective. Another acronym we can be using to help us sift through the bias quagmire is the idea of soapstone. We probably have mentioned this in class. If we haven't, we definitely will in the near future. But soapstone is an acronym that we can have memorized, and then when we are handed a new text, we can start to apply these small devices to figure out what is the text bias before, during, and after our reading. So here's what they stand for. S is for the subject. What are they writing about? O is the occasion. Why might they have written this particular piece? Is it to be supportive of the Broncos? Is it to be critical of the Raiders? A is the audience. Who is the intended audience? Is it Denver? Or are we reading an article that was written for the Oakland people. That might give us some indication as to who is writing it, who is being favorable to whom, things like that. P stands for purpose. Why exactly did they write this? What are they trying to do? Just entertain, persuade, convince, get us to change our mind, stop an election, things like that. The second S stands for speaker. We have to look at this and try to figure out who is telling this story. If it's Michael Moore, we know his slant. If it's Rush Limbaugh, we know his slant in the other direction. That will help us sift through those facts and opinions. And then ultimately, we come to the biggest part, which is tone. Kind of the end of the soapstone thing. What is the author's tone toward this subject? If we're reading an editorial about the Broncos and their amazing play last weekend, well, who wrote it? Why did they write it that way? Why didn't they say that the Raiders were amazing? We're able to figure out what is their attitude toward this subject. And once we kind of have figured out that, that helps us stay on track as we're reading to figure out the bias of that particular text. So here's some overlap between the written text that we're going to be looking at and some of the visual texts that we'll be looking at. One of the biggest things in written text is to listen to the word choice. When they're writing about the Broncos, from a Denver paper, do they say things like amazing, 
exceptional, tremendous? And then do they turn around and be critical of their opponent? Wow, those guys were horrible, ineffective. Those word choices are done intentionally, and those show the bias of the writer. A hometown newspaper is going to pump up their team and make them sound amazing. The newspaper for the opposing team is going to do just the opposite. Now, since we are in political season, we're probably inundated with tons and tons of political ads. And so, since these are visual and on our TV, there are some other elements that creators of text use to reveal their bias and try to put forth their message. And so, when we're watching some of these commercials, listen to the music. Look at the colors. When somebody's image is on screen and that image is being made by their own party, there's probably going to be happy music and positive colors whites, light, happy colors, things like that. When the other side is making an attack ad about that same person, notice how they are colored in terms of washed out, black and white, maybe some sort of dark red. Also, listen to the music. Does it make you nervous? Does it make you scared? If you can deduce who's making the ad and then what they're saying about that person on the ad, you can figure out who's doing it. You can figure out the bias of the filmmakers. And that's important because we may want to learn from those. We may want to steer clear from those. But either way, we have to be savvy consumers of information. What might be the point of view of the text in the following situations? If we saw a Republican political ad about Obama, would it be positive, negative, supportive, critical? What images might they put on screen? What images might they not? What type of music would be there? What type of coloring would be there? What type of text would go in there about Obama? This one's a little bit more difficult, but what if there was a democratic political ad about one of the subjects, education? You'd have to figure out what's the democratic position on public education. Then, what kind of imagery would they use? What kind of music? What kind of text? Stuff like that. So go ahead and stop these after each one and see if you can do a little brainstorming. So at this point, in summary of the term bias, remember the first slides we showed you. Bias, point of view, slant, perspective, they're all basically the same thing. When people create texts, they put in a bias to them. Sometimes it's overt, meaning they're very blatant about their perspective. Other times it's a little bit more subtle. Regardless, our job as readers and consumers of information is twofold. One, we need to identify the bias of the text we're reading. Who do they support? Who are they being critical of? Does that taint their message? Then, number two, we have to figure out what the message is, and then we have to decide, do we accept that message or do we reject it? We've sifted through the bias. We still have a choice to make. Maybe we can learn something from someone we don't really like and the bias that we don't naturally agree with. Maybe we can't, maybe it's too much. But regardless, we have to take those two steps to A, identify the bias, and then B, figure out where are the facts and opinions and can we learn from it. As always, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please bring those in the class and we will see you soon.